Testing. Summation is the first thing they would have to be able to do. That's right. And, uh, that stratification would be the next step plus. That's right. And they don't seem to do that. Uh, they just seem to claim that they can produce explicit formulas. I see. Well, I, I don't doubt that there are explicit formulas, and that's I'm certainly very interesting. Oh, geez. <laughs> I don't know. They do keep posting. Um, Thanks. Thank you. I spent the last uh, a few days, uh, a day or so it maybe, um, doing home, watching, goofing off, watching home movies, uh, which were very kindly provided to me by Sasha, and they um, are uh, home movies by um, um, Brown. Uh, Francis Brown. I got through three of them. Oh, cool. uh, uh, these are home movies. Francis Brown is doing something that's so here's the Langlands program over here and automorphic representations and functoriality. And over here is the Grotendieck, uh, I guess, what you'd call it, and it's, what does he call it? An esquisse, esquisse de un quelque chose. Uh, an esquisse de un program. Yes, and so they, uh, these are at the opposite ends of the spectrum, and uh, but they are both hoping to march towards the same goal and perhaps unite at some point. Um, and and, and uh, I think what, as I understand it, what, Fran what these Francis Brown and all these other people that worked on what are called, what are called um, uh, Tate motives, uh, mixed, mixed Tate motives, that there was something that uh, uh, sort of right the very tip of one side of things, the, the most direct things, and here we've got the most, um, I won't call them abstract, but it's at the other end, and we hope that these two things are going to come together, but uh, uh, mixed Tate motives or motives, you know, the, the, the simplest kind of mixed motives, which is, you know, really, really quite um, People sort of go, oh, when you mention mixed motives, I mean, they were something that Golden Gate really, uh, really, um, really was extreme. And everybody else were in that area were really ext extremely interested in. But, um, and I was waiting uh, about 15 minutes ago, uh, ago for him to get to the punchline and uh, the third home movie, and uh, so I hope I uh, can do this, uh, what I'm supposed to do today, without uh, um, uh, messing up. 
Um, I, in fact, what I'm going to do is just, I'm going to just finish what um, I started without uh, proving things. We, we got to um, what amounts to, uh, um, what, what seemed to amount to uh, a hitch. Um, and it had to do, if you remember how uh, the proof, uh, Langland's proof of Ramanujan's conjecture, very elaborate, very, very beautiful, um in retrospect um where he used uh, some uh, anal uh, analytic properties of uh, automorphic l functions uh, to prove something concrete about the data that goes into them and it was a quite an elaborate argument and uh, he would talk he talked about a arbitrary representation sigma of the l group and then to get a series, an L function of positive terms, he chose sigma in a very special way by choosing another representation rho and its contragredient and taking the tensor product of the two things. And anyway, we, I, I think I did anyway, um, uh, wondered whether the formula for the contragredient of rho is, gave exactly what he said, but it does. And I'm just, I'm not gonna go over it too, too much I mean, that was what the point that I think you raised and that Kumar raised, but in, in any case um, we're working we're, we're working with the group algebra of. Um, we are working with the group algebra of lambda. Um, what did I call it. Yeah, yes, uh, land, uh, the group algebra of this lattice and the vial, uh, um, L, the vial group invariance in that. And um, that is the group algebra, and that is the analog of what L1 of G would be if we were talking about unitary representations of a locally compact group. We are talking here about something much more circumscribed attached to the general group G. We're talking about rep, ir, uh, irreducible unitary representations of G. Fine, that's like the big picture, but with the very special condition that they their restriction to K, the maximal compact subgroup of, uh, we're talking about a piatic group. So KP, the maximal compact subgroup of this piatic group, such that the restriction of pi to kp contains the trivial representation. I'm just reviewing things that I've said before. Uh, and those things are constructed in a very particular way. They're given by induced representations, which I haven't really gone into, but an induced representation, that's, that's uh, a, a relatively elementary construction in this business. Represent, so I'm talking about representations of a piatic group whose restriction to the maximal compact subgroup contains the trivial representation. And one can show, we didn't prove it, but one can show that these things are gotten by getting, taking induced representations from a Borel subgroup of an unramified character on its uh, 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 split component. And so the bottom line is that Langlands shows that uh, if you just want to consider those representations, that's a small piece of the picture. I mean, it's the case almost everywhere and the data that they give is of fundamental importance, but within the general scheme of irreducible representations of a piatic group, it's a small piece of the picture and easily described piece. Whereas if you're talking about an arbitrary, <clears throat> rep arbitrary rep irreducible unitary representations of the piatic group, you have at the other extreme representations that are called supercuspidal, and they uh, they're as, as they're, they're just local objects, but they they would fill in uh, the pieces in, for example, in the automorphic representation or the corresponding L function that correspond to primes that lie in this finite set S. <clears throat> so there's only finitely many of them attached to a representation pi, but um, uh, they're much more complicated to construct. Uh, I think people, I think we're still, people are still trying to figure out exactly what they mean in general, although there's been a lot, I mean, how, how to classify them in general, 
although there's been a great deal of progress in the last few years on that question itself. But no, we're not talking about that. We're just talking about the ones whose restriction to K contain the trivial representation. And in that case, there is something that takes the role of L1 of G. There's a little algebra. Uh, it's this algebra. And the theory of um, irreducible unitary representations of GP, whose restriction to KP contains the one, uh, contains the trivial representation. And this much more circumscribed, much more elementary, really. Uh, I mean, you get the representations of G in an elementary way by induced representations. And something I, I say I haven't um, read, I don't think I even really defined them, but, and I didn't prove, well, it's not hard, uh, that they are the ones that have this property that their restriction to KP contains the one dimensional representation. Um, but uh, then it's not surprising that it, it's, it's interesting that there is, you know, when you look at it from a distance, um, it's interesting that they, there's still a picture between those uh, being bijective with representations of an associative algebra. It's just not the algebra that's not L1, because that would, that would account for many more. It's just this little thing that we have, the group algebra on this lattice. Um, um, uh, the group, in other words, functions from this lattice to complex numbers and invariants under the vial group. All right, so um, um, now if you have a function in T hat, the maximal torus in the dual group, um, you can um, evaluate it at an element in this lattice. So um, define, so um, C is an element um, uh, in T hat. This is the thing, uh, uh, eventually we're gonna want to consider a C and show that it actually lies in the maximal compact subgroup, the compact part of this of this torus, this complex torus. That's what Ramanujan conjecture says. But um, we just fill in the last steps that I'm missing. Um, so given a point, we're going to define C star, another point in this torus by lambda of c star okay so these uh, lambdas uh, an element in this lattice these are things that can be evaluated at uh, thing that in points in t star and we are simply going to define this as lambda c to the minus one complex conjugate all right so then we just have um, a couple of observations to make to finish this. Um, we have also introduced, given an element in here, we defined um, a one-dimensional representation of this algebra last time, and maybe the time before. Um, we evaluated it, uh, um, the general element, in, a general element in this algebra could be represented as a, fu a, a, a function f hat. Now, this is a function in the actual Hecke algebra, the algebra of, so this is halfway, uh, these functions uh, uh, f, um, they're ha they belong to an algebra that's halfway between L1 of G and this thing, namely the set of functions on the piatic group, which, um, uh, con uh, which are by invariant under the maximal compact subgroup. And then we had uh, the lemma that we had was the, the mapping from such functions f to functions f hat in here was an algebra isomorphism. And I, uh, uh, we wrote down the formula for this, the obvious formula. And so um, uh, what um, um, we have also defined a star on these functions, and this is, uh, the sum, by definition, this is the sum over lambda of f hat star of lambda 
lambda of c. That's what it means to evaluate something in this algebra at a point c. Um, so it, we've said what it is for this typical element in here, um, f hat, um, given as the image under the isomorphism from the actual Hecke algebra to this group algebra. But what I'm writing here is what it equals when you take not f hat, but f hat star. And so that's equal to, by the definition that we had last time, the sum over lambda, um, f hat star is the same thing as f hat minus lambda um, bar. And, um, well, I should do it in, I'll do it in two steps. This is um, uh, the sum over, by, by definition, this is the sum over f hat star lambda, lambda of c. And uh, okay, so the definition of f hat star of lambda is um, equal to um, f hat evaluated at minus lambda bar. This is what the natural definition uh, that we um, made on uh, what f star is at lambda. The star operation um, on this algebra here evaluated at something f hat that comes from the Hecke algebra. And so it is equal by, de this is by definition equal to this. And uh, I'm gonna rewrite this thing um, as minus lambda, this gets confusing, the notation, uh, um, the notation uh, for um, the lattice, it's the additive notation, so minus the lattice, an element in the lattice, um, when you evaluate it at something here, is uh, evaluating minus lambda of c to the minus one is just by definition lambda of c. It's just that multiplication, multiplicative notation is used in here and uh, additive notation is used here. So this is equal by definition uh, to this and minus lambda c to the minus one. So um, this is equal to the sum well, I can just, uh, instead of summing over minus lambda there, this and this, I can just sum over lambda. So this is equal to the sum over lambda of f hat um, lambda bar, that's what I've got there. And um, um, since I'm summing over, replacing minus lambda by lambda, this just becomes lambda at c to the minus one. All right, so um, this, um, uh, why did I write this twice? I don't know why I wrote it twice, but <laughs> uh, I was trying to collect my thoughts, I guess, when I was doing that. So it's confusing to have it appear twice. It looks like there's something in there, but there isn't. So this, this equals this by definition, which equals the changing each of the pieces by putting this uh, adjoint formula in, in, uh, for each of them. And so then this is a ch change from uh, right, so sum, uh, this is a change of summation from minus lambda, a change of integral, if you like, of lambda to minus lambda. And now, so I just, I will just repeat this since minus lambda at any point c, that's not what we got there, we had c to the minus one, but minus lambda at any point c is by definition lambda of c to the minus one. That's the notation that allows us to write this as this. So what does this mean? It means that Um, chi, I want uh, chi C, this is a formula for 
for chi c of the star of an element in the algebra. Um, so chi, what I want to do is to take that formula and simply take its complex conjugate. So chi c of f hat star, the star of this element in it. And if I want to take the complex conjugate of that, then what am I going to get? I will get the sum over lambda of um, um, f hat of lambda. That's what we've got there. And then I'm going to but have to put lambda c to the minus one conjugate. But we defined uh, c star, the um, lambda c star is equal to lambda c to the minus one bar. So this is equal to um, um, this thing then is equal to the sum over lambda of f hat lambda, um, lambda of um, c star. And so that's equal to, by definition, this is equal to um, this homomorphism at, la at f star um, evaluated at c star or determined by c star. This is chi, by definition, this is chi c star of f at In other words, uh, chi c, uh, chi c, um, chi c at f hat star conjugate is equal to chi c of f hat. Now that's for any point c in t hat. Um, we are assuming So C, C represents the parameter of an induced representation. And in this formula, I have not taken C to be a unitary uh, parameter, um, but that is part of the theory of, the, of uh, representations um, uh, with k-fixed vectors. Unitary ones come from a, a unitary character, um, in character of induction. So we are assuming that chi c is the one dimensional representation um, of the group algebra lambda l hat w. It's the one dimensional, they're all, these are all one dimensional representations, but we're assuming this is the one dimensional representation of the group algebra, let's say the group algebra of that lattice um, associated um, to a unitary representation pi of the piadic group um, uh, to, uh, to the, the assertion, this assertion is, we are assuming that this is the one dimensional representation of this group algebra associated to a unitary representation pi of G hat from among the representations uh, that can, of G P hat that contain the trivial representation. So a unitary representation of G P hat uh, uh, that contains uh, the trivial representation of kp. So the logic of this assertion is up here, we were just looking at what, um, uh, what happens when um, a chi comes from, a re uh, when c comes from a, re a representation of this con containing the trivial representation with no further conditions on it, but we are uh, assuming that pi is unitary. And what that means is, um, this means that the 
that pi c of f um, at star is equal to pi c of f hat bar. This is the condition. So um, I have not I haven't proved this. I've I've said that this is plot. This is what should be happening. Now I didn't check it. Langlands didn't check it at all. He he didn't put any of this stuff in. But I'm. Uh, I didn't check it. I got too involved in these home movies. But um, um, this is, I think maybe Malorus has checked it. Maybe Matthew's checked it. This is a one line proof. I, I assume we're a two line proof. So I'm going to say check. This assertion is what you, why you should expect that this be true. In other words, we're expecting that this the nice little uh, tame little tame group algebra up there is the algebra ver um, version of the unitary uh, representations of GP that contain the trivial representation. So that's why this should be true, but um, that's not a proof. One has to check it, and I'm assuming that that's true, and. If anybody checks it and gets a different answer, tell me and we'll fix it. But I'm leaving that for um, um, what what condition? Uh, sorry. This condition at the end that you write down. Uh -huh. That's corresponding. This is what we would get for any chi c. That's what we would get, and we have reduced it to the definitions. This is what we would get for any chi c. Uh, if we assume that chi that pi, it, and then this comes the, the the c comes from a general pi that contains the trivial representation. That's used here. That's used all the way through. That's that's part of introducing this algebra. Um, that's that's part of the given data uh, the, under which we introduce this uh, group. It's the reason why we introduce this group algebra. Uh, but now, the condition, the further condition, is that this representation of GP, um, it, uh, this representation of GP is unitary. And for that, um, I mean, this is this is for any re any representation of a GP. But if it's unitary, we should get this. This is what happens. This this is what it means. Um, it means for chi c. I see a homomorphism from this little baby group algebra to the complex numbers, and uh, so it's a representation. It's a one-dimensional representation of this group algebra, but this is what it means for this to be a one-dimensional one-dimensional star representation of this group algebra. Um, lambda L hat W. And so we had this general philosophy that unitary representations, irreducible unitary representations of a group, locally compact group, are bijective with um, st irreducible star representations. And that's the star representation. That's the um, thing that would correspond to unitary star representation of the group algebra L1 of G. And so now we've, we've, we've restricted the representations of, of G to these uh, ones. They're sometimes, I, I'd rather, maybe they're often called class one representations. Those that can, upon restriction to the maximal compact subgroup contain the trivial representation. So we're restricting ourselves now to class one 
unitary representations of uh, G. Um, this is what you get if you just for any class one representation, and this is something we just deduced from the definitions, but we are uh, thinking now of unitary class one representations. And if there really is a parallel between, if the parallel for um, unitary representations of G um, that are class one is with group, this small group algebra of star representations, then this is what you're going to get. That doesn't prove it. It's just, I'm just arguing, uh, I hope uh, in a way that makes this seem uh, exactly right, but one would have to check it, and I leave that to you to check. Does, does, that, does, that, does, that, does that make a, 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 do you want to you go, do you want to go ahead first? Yes. Can you, can you check this condition on, uh, on, on the character or for all, all characters associated with some two star vectors? Right? That's right. So, right down to this point, we have uh, just applied the definitions. We have deduced this from the definitions. Now, uh, the further uh, uh, question is what, how does this improve? when I assume that the, it's unitary. And it, well, uh, I, I'm not proving this, but I'm saying what it ought to be is if this really is true, if, this, uh, if the class one representations of G really do correspond to a, a, a whole separate group algebra, a much simpler group algebra, namely that thing up there, then this would be the condition, this, is a, this would be exactly the condition for the one-dimensional char character. So, so in, in other words, if uh, class one representations of L2 of G really do correspond to uh, representations of this one-dimensional representations of this group algebra, which is what we have, and we've shown sort of what they would look like, then to say that it's unitary would be to say it's a star representation of this. And what would it be to be what what is it what would it be to be a star representation of this? It would be um, this. This is star. Remember a star representation of um, an L one group algebra. A star representation of a group algebra uh, maps um, uh, um, the adjoint of an element in here to uh, maps. Yes, no, I'm sorry. This group algebra to begin with is a, is a Bonnach, I mean, on L2 of G, it's a Bonnach star algebra. And that, tra that translates in this very baby, in this uh, toy model of it, to be uh, something that uh, maps star. This, so so this, that, that makes, the, I'm sorry, the, as a star algebra, when L, for L1G to be a star algebra, that translates into this little toy version of it uh, to uh, have this operation um, on um, this operation on its elements. F hat stands for a general element in this little group algebra, and then F, F hat star is the uh, action of it, uh, uh, is the star action on that little group algebra. So L, this little, this group algebra, lambda, L hat, and W, is a star algebra with this thing that we've defined on general elements f hat in this group algebra, little group algebra. So that this is a star algebra. And what does it mean for a representation of a star algebra to correspond to a unitary representation of the group, which in this case would be correspond to a unitary class one representation in the group? It's that um, the, hom the homomorphism of that into the one dimensional uh, character of this thing, I uh, should send the star uh, operator um, this to the, uh, com to the adjoint operator on the Hilbert space, or what would be the adjoint operator on the Hilbert space if we were considering the whole thing. What's the adjoint operator of a multiplication operator on a one dimensional Hilbert space? It's the complex conjugate. Does, uh, does that make sense or is it, 
and this is this is uh, if what I've said um, for motivation is at all true, that's going to have to be true. But I, I'm doing this rather than checking it. I'm doing this uh, as motivation, and I'm leaving you to check it. If when you check it, it doesn't work out, we'll fix it. But I'm I'm, I'm sure it does. Yes. Yes. Pardon me. That's right. Yes. 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 Sorry, we've got we've got uh, we've we've got the Piatic Group GP, and in the general business of uh, unitary representations of a locally compact group, we've got the particularly important kind of uh, irreducible irreducible unitary representations. Those correspond to uh, irreducible representations of the group algebra, so-called group algebra of this group, namely L one of G the star algebra to represent to star representations, namely a representation of the, of the L1 algebra, who's, which when you evaluate it at star, gives you the adjoint of its value at the uh, point, point uh, um, who, <laughs> so we've got L1 of G, you have, we have a function, don't, we won't, let's not confuse that with f hat, but you have a function in L1 of G. L1 of G is a Banach star algebra with this star action, the star uh, uh, operation on it, this involution on it. And when it corresponds to a unitary representation of the original group, that's exactly the same as saying that um, the corresponding representation of the group algebra is a star representation and that means that when you evaluate uh, that when you take the representation of the star of a function which is transpose inverse um, I, uh, i'm sorry conjugate um, uh, transpose that that uh, corresponds to the adjoint of the value of that on the hilbert space uh, um, now this is a one-dimensional hilbert space the star, uh, the, um, an adjoint of an operator on a one-dimensional Hilbert space, operator would consist of multiplying a given vector by a complex number, the, the adjoint of that operator is just its complex conjugate. Pardon me? Okay. The Hecke algebra, uh, uh, that's right, that's right. And so after this operation one thing, you go to the wild mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh The idea is that if our uh, May I just interrupt you for a moment? I, I, uh, you probably are okay with this, but the Hecke algebra is not really a group algebra that fits into our general picture. And so what we're doing is we're saying that that is really what becomes of the group algebra, the general group algebra, but it's not really a group algebra in itself. So we're taking it and we're using the Satake transform to uh, make it isomorphic to a, a group algebra, a star algebra. Yes. Um, so when we, So we have this data, mm -hmm. we have this mm -hmm. reducible mm -hmm. which moment is not okay? And, and the idea that then when we uh, then chi sub c of mm -hmm. f hat mm -hmm. is giving us the eigenvalue of f hat on, on that chi sub c. Uh, can you just repeat that again? That chi sub c of uh, f hat star? Is it f hat? Yes. Uh -huh. so that Yes, yes, yes. And then we'd look and see what it does with star of f, and we get this. And uh, 
I, I, I um, don't, <laughs> I've got, I mean, I, uh, uh, I see some puzzled faces and I, I'm not sure I presented it in the, in the best way. If I could start again, which I'm not going to do, uh, I didn't, I, I never read through Langland's or never understood Langland's argument. And I wonder whether anybody else has too. And it's, uh, I don't um, regret having spent the time on it because I think it's a beautiful argument. I think that uh, it would be, if anybody wants to write a short paper explaining it, I think it would be very useful to the mathematical community. I don't think people have taken, I don't know whether anybody's taken this in, and I'm glad that I had the opportunity to lecture in it and realize I didn't understand it. I think I understand it now. And uh, if anybody wants to write, write it up, uh, it would be probably very valuable. As Kumar mentioned, it's very closely related to what Deline did that was very famous and got him a Fields Medal, um, namely uh, the, for the last of the Vey conjectures. They're, the techniques are very similar to this. They, uh, Deline did it uh, in maybe, what, 73, which was like about four, four years after Langlands did this. And they're very similar techniques, and it would be extremely worthwhile for anybody, any of you guys, you, I know you have other things to do, but to figure out this, and then if you want, you know, read Deline's proof and see how they, exactly how they fit together. It's, it's not exactly the same thing, but this business of uh, taking um, a representation sigma of the dual group, um, and then, but of the form rho, um, uh, rho tensor rho tilde, um, I guess I should I should just add the one sentence. Um, I, I, I should say um, here, this is coming over here, and hence that C equals C star. Well, maybe not quite, but modulo W. Uh, i.e. in the same w orbit. And then from this, this implies, so I go back to the thing that uh, originally puzzled us when we were doing this, namely when we took an arbitrary representation of the dual group, rho, and we took its contragredient, and then we um, tensor product it, producted it with rho that you got a representation that gave po uh, uh, whose L function had was po had positive uh, it was a Dirichlet series with positive coefficients. So I'm just going to say that this implies this is the thing that uh, seemed dubious um, to some of us. This implies that. Um, um, for the representation rho, which I won't re recall again, but it re was a representation of the dual group, and it implies that the complex conjugate of that is equal to the trace of rho tilde of C, um, where uh, rho tilde is the contragredient. Um, of an arbitrary. We took rho to be arbitrary. What's fixed is C, but an arbitrary um, finite dimensional and it's always assumed that these are holomorphic um, um, representation um, uh, of G hat. Okay, so that again has to be thought about a little bit. So I, I would ask you to check this, but I think we're, so check this and check this. Um, that was the step that we got lost on, but um, if we look back at what we did, uh, I'm afraid it was last week, so 
this is how we produced a representation sigma of the L group, uh, of the dual group. Um, this was a large representation. Um, and this is how we produced a representation that um, um, took the inequality that we had for, or took the, took the equality uh, that we had for the possible obstruction of the representation pi p to be um, tempered. And uh, we got an inequality for that, an inequality for that. But, and then for any representation sigma of the dual group, where we're talking about um, the, uh, the coefficients of the Dirichlet series of the L function attached to this and any representation of the dual group. And then we, we found a, an, um, an, est an equality, an estimate for the size of the obstruction to Ramanujan's conjecture of this thing uh, for any given sigma. And then we took rho to be a very large representation and we took tensor product of rho with its contragradient, and we took the sigma, and that made the uh, an, an estimate that was where the problem was the uh, the offending piece of um, the induction uh, of the induced representation um, got very small when we applied the estimate that we got for an arbitrary representation here, or but to this and the representation of that sort. So I hope uh, I hope it's not uh, you've probably forgotten this as perhaps I have too. But um, I, I think it all works out. I think it's I think it's I think it is uh, 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 really a very beautiful argument, which has not really been exploited. Um, so yes, Malors, did you check this? Yes. Yes. Pardon me. Where? 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 This thing? Yes. This thing? Yes. This tells you that. Um, C equals C star because this is true for every F. That's right. So you're saying that this chi of C star of this chi of C. That's correct. So it's the same character, I guess. So they have to be the same guy from below. Because, you're, because that's true for every F. Okay. Because it's true for every F, that says that these have got to be the same things. And then this is, you will say that. That's true. Good. So in order to compare the chain of inequality with the chain of equality with this is there, uh -huh. you need to put F hat there uh -huh. and the star of the person. Pardon me? So you need to change the way of so this equation is fine, but in order to get to this is fine. We've proved this. This follows directly from the definitions. Yeah, that's right. But in order to compare it with algebraic law, you need to put F hat to the third case. Um, um, yeah, that's what we've got. That's what we've got. I mean, um, uh, um, so we've got a C star here. Have I written something? Have I, have I not written down? No, no, it's correct. I'm just saying that if, if you want to compare this exactly with what you write, um, um, so I've got this, and um, then here uh, I um, uh, yes, I think I should have written a C star here, right? Pardon me? Is that correct? Has I written it?
Um, no, I, I need a C star, right? I gotta have a, um, a type. Pardon me? Uh, so. Mm -hmm. Yes. So let me just rewrite what I um, um, let me. I'm not sure. Then. That's right. This implies maybe scratch that sentence, and I'll just say this implies that. I C star of F hat equals chi C of F hat star conjugate, and I guess that must be the, the thing we've already proved, but that that in turn uh, then equals chi C of F. So this F hat, this equals this for every f hat. And so therefore f hat, uh, that's an arbitrary element that implies that this <laughs> implies, uh, uh, this implies this, that c equals c hat, and then that implies this. I'm sorry if, I'm sorry if I, um, if I had it to do over again, maybe reading week, I'll just start all over again, and I'll do everything much more orderly. Uh, but uh, sometimes uh, I had a, a well, there was a, a senior colleague of mine when I was a graduate student, it wasn't Langlands, but there was a senior colleague of mine that um, often got stuck when he was lecturing to graduate students. And he said, no, it's good. It's good when you get stuck on these things because then you're everybody in the room is forced to think them through. Um, I don't know whether that's, I don't know if I believe that, but in any case, uh, I'm going to appeal to it. Uh, and I, I hope that, um, I, I hope at least, if you haven't followed everything, um, I hope at least that you um, take my word for, the, well, I mean, I mean, you know, everybody's short of time. But if you can figure, if you can put these things together, I think, I think they're all here, uh, you have understood a beautiful proof that nobody else, I, I suspect, has understood. And you can come and ask me questions if you have any further uh, queries on it. But I have to get on to something else now. I'm so, oh my gosh. Sorry. Well, what I'm going to do now, and I'm not, I, I won't do it now, but this is the fourth example which is the generalized Sato Tate um, conjecture. Or maybe one should call it a question. Um, Sato Tate was a very specific um, um, question or conjecture. Uh, for uh, what happens once we know uh, this answer to Ramanujan's conjecture, and it was just for the group SL2. So if you would indulge me, I'll just go for a couple more minutes. The generalized Sato Tate conjecture question um, is something that applies for any automorphic representation. Well, we could say maybe for GLN, um, for cuspidal um, uh, for cuspidal automorphic representation of G uh, equal, and I'm going to say, say <laughs> GLN. It'll, it'll have a version for any group, and we just have to be careful as to how we phrase it. And so, um, so, um, Maybe I could just say the setting would be um, where G over Q um, is a split group. The same setting that we had for this last discussion of Ramanujan. Split over QP. Uh, T hat lies in D hat, lies in G hat, as in 
the previous example, Graham Newton's conjecture, as in 3F, um, and then take um, take pi to be a cuspidal automorphic representation um, uh, of GA with pi. So this is just exactly what we had before, pi giving rise now to a collection of conjugacy classes CP uh, for P not in S and then assume what we've spent the last uh, more than a week uh, discussing, but assume Ramanujan um, um, for pi. Each of these pi for pi. That would mean Ramanujan for each of these classes CP. And what does Ramanujan say? It says that um, uh, each of these classes, not just being conjugacy classes in um, uh, G hat, but each of them um, uh, intersect the compact part. So i.e. Uh, each CP intersects Um, the maximal compact. This is another way of saying uh, what functoria, how, what Ramanujan's conjecture would be, and what we have uh, justified um, uh, if you assume functoriality. Uh, the compact part, the maximal compact, um, well, maybe I, uh, um, these are conjugacy classes in the dual group and Ramanujan says that they each meet the maximal compact subgroup but then they a conjugacy class semi-simple conjugacy class in a max in a compact subgroup is going to intersect a um uh maximal torus so I, why don't i just say each cp intersects um the um the compact part Um, part new hat of the maximal compact subgroup. Uh, of, 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 I'm sorry, the compact part of the maximal torus T hat in B hat in G hat. Okay, so you've got all these conjugacy classes, they all sit semi simple conjugacy classes, they're all in the dual group, just a complex group. Complex groups have maximal compact subgroups. And uh, also this complex group has maximal torus T. And uh, that's going to have a, uh, a compact piece product of uh, um, E to the I thetas and a non compact these bunch of real lines. We have just shown, ho oh ho, uh, that uh, with uh, uh, functoriality, that uh, actually there's any one of these classes, for any given P, has no real part. They all lie, they all um, lie as vial orbits in this maximal compact uh, torus, U hat, a real torus, topological torus in here. And so the question is, how are they distributed? As P varies, you've got uh, you have e to the i theta, maybe from zero going uh, zero going theta going between zero and two pi. How are they distributed? Modulo two pi. Very concrete question. You know, you're dealing with SL two r. You've got all of these. You've got a cuspidal automorphic traditional thing, a uh, cusp form, a modular form. Uh, um, you've got all these conjugacy classes. And uh, with, with Ramanujan, they all meet this um, maximal torus, um, which for SL2 is just the numbers 
theta between uh, zero and pi. How are they distributed? Do they clump up? Are they uniformly distributed? Well, the uh, generalized Sato Tate conjecture says exactly what they are. Um, and it's, uh, it looks a little bit um, strange at first. And we'll say that after reading week, why it looks strange. But in fact, it's not strange at all. It's just they have to, it has to be interpreted in a certain way. And so we're going to, I'm not going to try to prove it. Langlands just has one sentence about it. Uh, but for the group GL2, uh, it's been proved. And it was a big deal. It was been proved by T Richard Taylor and Kozel and a bunch of people a few years ago. And um, um, we'll talk about it. And there's a really, a really good thing that, well, anyway, there's some, I, I don't want to load you up with work, but there's some, something very interesting that one could try to do with it. Um, so we'll talk about that in 10 days from now. Again, I don't know how much people have, I mean, people have thought about the Sato Tate conjecture. Um, uh, um, and I don't know how much, but I don't know how much people have thought about generalizing it. And there's an obvious question that you can ask about the Sato Tate conjecture. And I don't know whether people have thought about it. And but it's a very natural and interesting question, which we'll consider in 10 days. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes. Um, uh, I mean, the, what, what um, the reason that in this particular case this is a very particular case, the reason it's not uniformly distributed is because um, of a change of variables. The integral over conjugacy classes in a compact group has a Jacobian in it, and it's like something like four sine squared theta. And that's what and it looks very strange when you see it, but it's because you have a change of variables formula that forces it on you. I'll, I'll talk about this in, in great detail. Um, I mean, it's, it's straightforward. So, all right. I mean, the question is, okay, that uh, A, can you, uh, I suspect that if you assume functoriality, it come, I mean, these guys, Taylor and people will know this off the top of their head, but I, I, I haven't thought about it myself, but I suspect if you assume functoriality, the Sato Tate conjecture uh, probably is, it proves it probably in a pretty, maybe easier than the Ramanujan conjecture. I can't, I'm not gonna think about it, but that's a very interesting project. But then it's something really interesting uh, that sort of says they're uniformly distributed over a torus. What about the error term? Is there, a, is there an error term in that? Has anybody thought, has Katz thought about that? It's an obvious question, and I don't know why anybody hasn't thought about it. It's probably hard, and it might, well, I'll turn this off. 